Hi, I'm Nick Palmashano. And I'm Matt Finney. And this is the Bad News Network. Welcome to Monologue Land. Population, Kamala Harris. Harris was chosen by Vice President Biden as his running mate, and the amazing hysteria everywhere has been as expected. I don't want to cover most of what's been said because it's so far off the chain it isn't even worth discussing, but let's hit some of the highlights and then talk about what her impact on Biden might be. Democrats began a pre-announcement campaign that basically said, once the announcement is made, there's going to be an immediate attack trying to make the candidate unlikable because she's a woman, essentially labeling everyone as misogynist that could dare oppose their vice presidential candidate. Admittedly, not a terrible strategy, and data does show that women are judged far more harshly for being likable or unlikable than men are. However, after what the Democrats did to Sarah Palin, it's probably unreasonable to expect that any candidate is gonna be treated in an even-handed manner. This election is going to be bloody and it's unreasonable to think otherwise. People are no longer rational when it comes to politics. I'll hit the top three talking points that I think you should consider being careful about before jumping into the fray as we move into the next phase of this miserable, miserable election. One, immediately we're seeing tons of comments about her alleged promiscuity. Joe and the Ho is my personal favorite, with Kamala Harris as a close second. I'm not diving into the morals of this one way or the other because we all have our own moral basis for judging sexuality. That being said, by any standard, her potential sins pale in comparison to President Trump, JFK, Harding, LBJ, and even Ike. So given that, if you're going to be honest, you have to weigh her potential misdeeds at at least an even level as you did with those presidents. So if you're gonna judge her fairly based on at least that aspect of her character, she's no worse than those guys. The second big one is her level of progressiveness. The New York Times actually just did a profile piece touting her as a moderate, which I, I've gotta be honest, I shot coffee out of my nose when I saw that. Conversely, President Trump is labeling her as a batshit crazy liberal. The truth is definitely in between those two things. She's been consistent on a few things. She's consistently been a supporter of LGBTQ rights, rights for people of color, and rights for women. She's also consistently come out strongly on providing pathways for illegal immigrants to become naturalized citizens or at least get green cards. She also co-sponsored the radical Green New Deal, which attempted to wage war on climate change at a cost of between 51 and $93 trillion over the next 10 years. With our annual tax revenues at just over $3 trillion, a massive shortfall like that is not a particularly moderate position. In other areas, it feels more like she's riding the tides of political expediency rather than carving out strong positions. She initially sponsored Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All plan, which made private insurance illegal and basically made government insurance the law of the land, but backed off of that as soon as she started taking heat and instead introduced a hybrid model that allowed for both government insurance and private insurance. Nevertheless, all of those areas are extremely progressive. She is, however, a fairly pro-business Democrat, an area that she's taken a lot of heat for in democratic circles. Not to say that she hasn't gone after companies the way she did when Uber tried to introduce driverless vehicles. She's also extremely aggressive on consumer advocacy, taking the big banks to task for some of their mortgage and lending policies. Now, where she's going to run into trouble with both Republicans and Democrats is she's already being labeled as Kamala the cop. If we cast our minds back to the presidential primaries, it was on this very issue that she was absolutely gutted by Tulsi Gabbard. She was a very aggressive prosecutor, putting a lot of people of color in prison for things that the Democratic Party now scoffs at, like marijuana possession. And that fact hasn't been lost on the population. Her exchange with Tulsi Gabbard dropped her from front runner status to less than 3% of the vote in the primary. That's sure to come up again. On guns, she wants to stop the import of AR and AK type weapons and have much more stringent regulations about who can own them. There's a good chance that her opinion is going to morph into Biden's plan of total confiscation of all weapons he deems assault weapons. So synopsis. She's extremely liberal on climate and healthcare, though she hasn't gone full Sanders on health. She is a pro-consumer moderate on business. 
And she's a moderate in progressives clothing on crime. She's not anti-gun yet, but I'm looking at that to be an area where she moves closer and closer to Biden's view of a completely AR-less America. Now there's a third talking point that you absolutely need to be careful with. In fact, just stay away from it. It's not helpful. And that's the idea that she is not eligible to run for president because her parents were not citizens when she was born, even though she was born in America. This whole thing kicked off because an article ran in Newsweek that in theory was going to be a discussion amongst constitutional scholars about the true meaning of the 14th Amendment. In practice, however, this was just a clickbait article that wanted to get people riled up and get a lot of clicks and a lot of comments that basically was gonna start birtherism all over again. Harris was born in America. She is a citizen. She is constitutionally qualified to run for president. Don't confuse disliking any policies that she might have for her not being able to run for office. Taking that position diminishes you and sets a bad precedent that we absolutely don't wanna kick off going into this election. So what does Harris do for the Biden campaign? I have mixed feelings about her efficacy as a vice presidential candidate. Now, what I'm about to say will anger people, but once again, this is just my best objective view at what I think the outcome of her involvement will be and not any personal desire to see things one way or the other. So here goes. Pros for the Democrats. Joe Biden excites no one. For many people, he was the best of a lot of bad options, which seems to be the theme of elections lately. Harris, while she didn't garner a huge percentage of the vote during the primaries, actually has a small but very excitable contingent. And a lot of young people are happy to see somebody in this election that isn't an old white guy. That, coupled with the fact that she's the first woman not named Hillary, with a legitimate chance of entering into the executive branch is likely going to increase voter turnout in the Democratic Party. Democrats absolutely did not turn out for Hillary Clinton. And despite all of the online comments about people saying, oh, we need to stop Trump, we need to stop Trump, people are fundamentally lazy. And they probably weren't gonna turn out for Joe Biden the way that they claim they would. Whereas I think that a lot of people will turn out for Harris. Another pro for the Democrats is that Harris is absolutely up to the task of being the attack dog during this election. Joe Biden has never been particularly adept at either debate or wordplay, and he's clearly lost a step as of late. Unless Harris Kryptonite, AKA Tulsi Gabbard, is in the room, Harris is more than capable of dominating a debate with either Pence or Trump. Trump has a certain bullying gravitas that protects him from attacks that other people would fall under, but Pence isn't as strong in that arena, and I expect the vice presidential debate to be pretty brutal. The biggest threat with having her in there is going to be she goes too far and attacks Pence in a very personal way, in particular along the lines of either his religion or his family, which people do get carried away in these debates and it could happen. And I think that will definitely hurt her. It's the same thing that hurt her when she went after Joe Biden. A lot of people did not like her after she was seen as being cruel. But that doesn't mean she's a great candidate either. There are a lot of cons for the Democrats. The biggest one though is just, she isn't a candidate that's going to move either independence or never Trumpers. Democrats are fond of saying, if everything that Trump has done so far doesn't change your mind, then nothing will. And I think that's an emotional kind of take my ball and go home response that consistently hurts them. If the goal, as Joe Biden has claimed, is to create a big tent party, then Harris absolutely does not help them. And I hate to go back on something that we talked about already at the beginning of this thing, but women are gauged on whether or not they are likable, and Harris is not super high on that likability scale for most people. So essentially, I look at this as the Democrats making the clear decision that they're going to use Harris to excite the Democratic base and go after Trump and Pence relentlessly and just basically say, we're not worried about the independents or any Republicans that might come our way. Will it be enough for the Democrats or will President Trump once again defy the odds with the silent majority? Only time will tell. Until then, we, like you, look forward to the riots on November 4th, regardless of who wins.
It's going to be a festive time. The Hong Kong the world has known for decades is rapidly disappearing under the new national security law that went into effect June 30th. Almost immediately, Chinese police began arresting and abducting any and all participants in pro-democracy protests, including government officials. They banned the Tiananmen Square vigil, which is a yearly tradition in Hong Kong, and later went after and arrested everyone that they knew attended. This week, the Hong Kong media outlet Apple Daily and their publishing company Next Digital were swarmed by Chinese police. They arrested media tycoon Jimmy Lai, along with his two sons and a few other executives, for conspiracy to defraud and collusion with foreign forces. Under the new national security law, charges like these can come with a heavy price, with sentences up to life in prison. Police were reportedly taking anything and everything from desks and in the entire building that possibly resembled pro-democracy support. President Trump's security advisor, Robert O'Brien, called out China, saying that these are just attempts to suppress pro-democracy supporters and intimidate the Hong Kong independent press. The Hong Kong government has been playing the stay calm, all is well card for the time being. And at the same time, Hong Kong leader Carrie Lam has invoked emergency powers due to the pandemic and prevented the elections from happening this year. She reportedly postponed these elections to a date which nobody's clear about, but supposedly it's not gonna be this year, it'll be sometime in 2021. And no one is denying that this is just an overt move to keep Hong Kong from voting out the blatant Chinese shill, Carrie Lam. So in the meantime, the Chinese government is working overtime to intimidate and eliminate any opposition. This week, a man named Darius Sessoms murdered his five-year-old neighbor in front of his two sisters, aged seven and eight. The little boy's name was Cannon Hinnant, and Sessoms shot him at point-blank range in the face. The killer is black and the victim is white, and many people are calling out the fact that if the races had been reversed, there would be a media frenzy right now. Instead, the mainstream media is largely ignoring the story. They're probably right, but I've got to be honest with you, I really don't care about any of that. I have a five-year-old. I don't know what has to be wrong with you to look at the sweet face of a five-year-old kid and pull the trigger, but I have to be completely honest, this story has me emotional. I'm vacillating between rage, sadness, and despair, and then back to rage. The man has been arrested and will face trial. There were many witnesses, including his two sisters. He will probably spend a lifetime in prison. But God damn it, this guy deserves worse than that. A whole lot worse. Rest in peace, Cannon. You were just getting started, little buddy. I am so sorry. Oh, college football. The multi-billion dollar industry where state officials and presidents of universities pretend it's all about the education of the individual instead of making that sweet, sweet green. In a developing story, two out of the five Power Five conferences have decided to cancel their season. Now this isn't just some schools deciding not to play a football game. This is a multi-billion dollar decision where the presidents of the universities can't justify getting their athletes onto buses and planes who are supposed to be amateurs but just playing a game around the United States while they rake in millions in the event that they might get the coronavirus. The other three conferences have said, we're playing. The players want to play, the coaches want to play, the fans want the players to play. But there's this fraud of amateurism that clouds the whole situation. Should players be allowed to opt out and keep their scholarship if they so choose? Are campuses even safe at all? Can schools invest in actual physical bubbles like some other top tier professional teams to keep their athletes away from other people? Is that even a fair practice? Lots of great questions here, but billions are on the line, so the hell with these kids, let's play some ball. My prediction, the coronavirus will run rampant. And when that one kid dies of it, the whole thing will get shut down because no president wants to be responsible for that. Chicago has been a hotbed for violence and this week is no different. Looting and widespread destruction and vandalism kicked off this Sunday after rumors spread that police had shot a fleeing black man. The fleeing suspect was shot five times but is recovering in the hospital. The suspect, Latrell Allen, age 20, said he never had a gun on him. The police then showed a photo of the gun they alleged that he carried. Unfortunately, this is a he said, she said situation because the police weren't wearing any body cameras. Black Lives Matter Chicago preferred their version of the story and by midnight, the entire city was being looted and destroyed. In total, 13 police officers were injured, 
One civilian and security officer was shot and wounded, and over a hundred arrests have been made. Naturally, this kicked off a bunch of political infighting. Mayor Lori Lightfoot is under attack by one side for not being hard enough on the rioters and looters, and on the other side for siding with the police over Black Lives Matter. House Representative Jim Durkin has expressed no confidence in her ability and has asked for the National Guard to come in and support Chicago. Trump also has been hammering home the idea of bringing in the Guard, which Lightfoot has been adamant that she does not want to do. Instead, she stated that President Trump needs to step up with stronger measures to solve this problem, namely gun control. A valid point, because as we all know, responsible gun owners are the reason for all of this violent crime and looting. On Tuesday, the Secret Service shot a man who allegedly threatened the officers. The man supposedly told a uniformed Secret Service officer that he was armed. He then charged him, drew, and dropped down into a shooting stance. The officer acted quickly and shot him in the torso. Both the officer and the suspect were taken to the hospital, as is protocol. The suspect is alive and recovering, while an investigation is ongoing as to whether or not he has a history of mental issues. The head of the Secret Service Uniform Division, Tom Sullivan, did not give any other details on the incident. And all this occurred during a press conference President Trump was holding in the White House. When the shot was fired, he was rushed from the briefing and brought to a secure room. When asked later if he was at all rattled by the incident, President Trump responded, do I look shook? I ain't scared to look, because there ain't no such thing as halfway crooks. That's a Mob Deep reference for you hip-hop heads. The LA Times released an article this week that said that camping is racist and too expensive for people of color to participate in. Where was I? There are a lot of directions I could take this in, but I'll try to keep this as short as possible. First of all, being poor isn't affiliated with a particular race. And it's probably actually racist to assume that people of color can't afford something as exotic as camping. Also, by definition, being homeless isn't expensive, which is essentially permanent camping for many people. Survival skills are learned, not bought, and require time and effort. And if you really want to commit to this lifestyle and have lots of long walks throughout nature with all expenses covered, I'd like to refer you to a nice little place that I spent some time in called the Army. Now, the silver lining here is that the person that this article was written about actually was a person of color that said, you know what, like, camping is great. I want to share this experience with other people. So I'm going to raise money to bring other people of color camping and give them the basic equipment necessary to do so. Now these kits are being bought from places like REI, where things are, shall we say, not particularly cheap. But hey, it's a charity, so whatever you want to supply people with, just go nuts. But again, the important point here is that the skills that you need to survive in this environment require some effort. The actual equipment is pretty cheap if you're not, you know, blowing it all out. I did a quick Google search and literally the first thing that popped up when I, when I put in, you know, buy camping tent was a tent for $30. It was like $31.99. And the next thing I typed was sleeping bag camping. And the first thing that popped up was a Walmart sleeping bag for $9.99. So basically for a couple of Andrew Jackson's soon to be Harriet Tubman's, you could be a camper. Then once you have that $40 worth of stuff, you can go outside and just stay there for as long as you want. Boom, camping. In a global race to create the first COVID-19 vaccine, Russia announced this week that it has a working and ready vaccine ready to ship. Calling it the Sputnik 5 after the Russian satellite in a gross lack of creativity, President Putin went on to say that even his own daughter has taken it and is feeling well. According to him, at least 20 countries have placed orders in the billions for vaccines. But while Russia may be patting itself on the back, world scientists are concerned that the vaccine is being rushed through instead of being put through phase three testing. Many are saying that the government may be Putin prestige before safety. An Air Force helicopter was shot at while flying near Manassas, Virginia this week. I'm sorry, but while this is a serious story, I have to tell you that every time I drive up 95 and see the sign, I think, man asses. 
It makes it worse that the city it's right next to is called Dumb Fries. So it's man asses and dumb fries. Okay, that's a sidebar. Back to the helicopter being shot at. The pilot was injured during the incident and was immediately taken to the hospital. It's been announced that he was released and is in good condition. The FBI and the Air Force are currently investigating the incident and it's unclear whether or not somebody was targeting the helicopter or if they were just firing into the air Iraqi style. AMC Theaters is back in business and to celebrate they want you to know just how much you can save by going to the movies. For 15 cents you can sit within a few feet of a few hundred people, stare at a screen for plus or minus two hours, but this time with the roulette of whether or not they may or may not have coronavirus. Now Christopher Nolan's movie Tenet looks awesome. I don't understand the premise, but then again I didn't really understand the premise of the Inception trailer and I ended up liking that movie a lot. So hell, I'll go see that for 15 cents. And for the big screen and the feel of those fine pleather seats, I'm willing to shell out some cents. In an interview with Fox Business, President Trump basically admitted that he will block all attempts to give additional funding to the post office because he doesn't want to support mail-in voting. We talked about this a few weeks ago on BNN, but this is inherently the problem with the post office. It's asked to be run like a private business, but it isn't allowed to set its pricing or its benefits. So the government is controlling how much postage costs, what days they have to run, what people get paid, how much pension they have to be paid, and even the hours. But yet, they're supposed to be coming in profitable. How do you do that when you can't control the things that allow you to be profitable? And then when the service can't operate in the black because of all the restrictions the government has put on it that don't allow it to operate in the black, the money that is lent to them is provided with additional restrictions which make it harder to run in the black. Trump's defense has been and will continue to be that he doesn't want the USPS to run because it's bleeding America dry. But really this whole thing is just about people's ability to send mail-in ballots. This is one of the boldest attempts in my lifetime by a sitting government official to decrease voter turnout. Usually politicians just like to gerrymander the f out of some districts, but this is a whole different level. The USPS performs a critical function while employing a vast number of people. It also allows below cost shipments for up to 140 billion packages a year allowing a lot of small businesses to stay in the same ballpark as the bigs for pricing. USPS also offers rural shipments to places that a lot of the bigs don't really like to go to, and it provides affordable overseas shipping. Eliminating the USPS would send shockwaves through the country. So as we see it, there are three options for reasonable ways to move forward. Option one, decide here and now that the USPS is actually a service and not a business and eliminate the whole concept of a profit and loss. Option two, keep it as part of the government, but allow USPS to run as a true business, including setting its own pricing hours and so forth. Option three, privatize USPS and basically just add it into the mix with UPS, FedEx, and DHL. But whichever option you prefer, this should be debated and decided by Congress and not unilaterally by the executive branch in the midst of an election where they absolutely can influence the result. Despite the president's post office gaffe, he did have a good week, facilitating a treaty of cooperation between Israel and the UAE. The treaty is groundbreaking and marks the first time that a Gulf kingdom has made such an agreement. Typically, any agreements have required Israel to give up land for a temporary period where attacks would be stayed. But this time, the agreement is a peace for peace deal where both countries acknowledge that their countries will be stronger through partnership. As part of the agreement, Israel will halt expansion into Palestinian territory as requested by the president. A big explanation for the increased cooperation of the Gulf states with Israel is that they're all beginning to see a common enemy. Iran and the jihadists they support. As the Gulf continues to invest in infrastructure and businesses continue to sprout there, added security has moved to the forefront instead of religious beliefs. Gordon Gecko would be proud. Sesame Place in Pennsylvania is an amusement park themed to the lovable characters of Sesame Street. You would think that a park focused on little kids and having lovable characters like Cookie Monster, The Count, Snuffleupagus, or Elmo would be a happy place. Nah, bro, it's mad hostile over there and you better be ready to swing them hands. An adult couple was apparently furious when a 17-year-old worker 
asked them to put on masks because that was the park's policy. Well, they didn't like this, so they decided to beat the kid up. And we're not talking just a minor shellacking. An ambulance picked up the 17-year-old where he had to go to the hospital to get his broken jaw and shattered teeth fixed. The couple appears to have escaped before the police arrived. However, they are on camera in multiple locations and the police have said they are very confident they'll be able to track these people down. So this is what we're doing now. We're beating up hourly workers, kids, because we don't like a private entity's policy on masks? Grow the f up. And finally in Florida news, a SWAT team raided a retirement complex this week after multiple reports of unkept property and drug use. Five people were arrested, including 43-year-old Kathleen Unrath, who was the niece of the property owner. Officers found enough methamphetamine to charge the group with intent to sell. But more interesting is that they uncovered the dark underbelly of Florida golf cart racing. Hidden inside what most people would expect to be a run-of-the-mill meth lab was actually a very elaborate golf cart chop shop. These souped-up bad boys can net a shop anywhere from 1500 bucks to 20 Gs. The Furious Five were using the ruse of a mom-and-pop meth lab to hide their elaborate multi-hundred dollar golf cart tell. That's high science, baby. We're witnessing the next evolution of Florida man slash woman. Anyway, all five are going to jail, and we've seen a shocking reduction in golf cart crime ever since. And with that, I'm Nick Palmashano. And I'm Matt Finney. And this is the Bad News Network. Our news is at least as bad as the news you're getting already, and I just have to tell you, I am shocked that Jelaine Maxwell is still alive. Nobody had this over. Anyway, as always, you can get 25% off at rangerup.com using the code BNN. Have a great weekend.